Welcome to the Hybrid Real Estate Professional Podcast, where we dive deep into the intersection of career, family, and finances. Learn the mindsets, tips, and strategies to help you on your personal journey to build a life of abundance and purpose for you and your family. Now, here's your host, Aaron Amin. Welcome back to another episode of the Hybrid Real Estate Professional Podcast. This week, we're going to air an appearance I had on the Art of Connecting podcast with my friend and fellow investor, Hayden Fike. Hayden is a 24-year-old, and he is a super connector if I have ever met one. The theme of his show is about how people have learned to connect, network, and grow alongside others. I share a ton of details about my career before I was in consulting and real estate investing. We go through how I navigated choppy corporate politics in the infamously volatile entertainment industry. I don't sugarcoat anything, so you'll get a candid view of my experience and how it shaped me into who I am today. I hope you enjoy this unique episode where we peel back the onion and cut to the core. Here it is. It's difficult to tell this story without it just sounding a little bit like nepotism. Let me say this. When you go to business school, the value usually is in the network just as much as it is the education, right? And so my classmate was the daughter of the president of Light Nation in Seattle. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Art of Connecting podcast. We have Aaron Amin here with us today. Me and Aaron spent time together in Costa Rica on the Action Academy retreat. Aaron has just started up his own podcast and we were like, hey, do you want to go on mine? And I was like, hey, do you want to come on mine? And so we're both going to interview each other. It's going to be a little bit of inception when you look at our podcast, but Man, I'm so excited to have you here today. Before we got started recording, I got to know Aaron a little bit more, especially because we were both all over the place during the trip. And it tends to happen sometimes when you're just both outgoing people. You don't even get to really know everybody when you're in a room with 35 people. But anyways, thank you so much for coming on today. How are you? I'm doing great, Hayden. Thank you for having me. You won the battle and you got to be the interviewer first. But yes, as you said, I plan to have you on my show too and get to ask the questions. But for now, I'm, I'm happy to be here and answer anything you'd like to know about me. I love it. Let's go ahead and roll into it, and get started and just talk about your beginnings, what you were sharing with me before we got started and where your career began. Sure. It's a little origin story about me. As a kid, I was a drummer. And so I was a, a big music enthusiast. I performed a lot starting in middle school. All the way through my mid-20s, I played the drums. So it's been about 24 years since I started playing drums. Music became a huge part of my life. I was in a lot of different bands. And in my college years, I started playing a lot of shows around town. And I started as a music major in college, but then I switched and ultimately finished with a business major. But all the while I was playing shows, I was in a band. We did some regional touring. We were based out of Seattle at the time. And so during that time, I was booking all of our shows, co-managing the band with our lead singer. And so I learned how to like book and string together our own tours and build relationships with all the different owners and bookers at, at these different clubs. And through that process, I met a lot of the key players in the concerts industry in Seattle. And actually one of the people I went to college with uh, her dad was the president of the local Live Nation office in Seattle. And Live Nation, for those who don't know, what concert behemoth, the uh, largest concert promoter in the world. They own Ticketmaster. They own House of Blues. Uh, biggest player out there for, for concerts. So for music enthusiasts like me, uh, I actually got the opportunity to do a um, formal mentorship with the president of the local Live Nation, which later became a job. So I said all that very fast, but essentially I took my passion for music as a performer and built relationships within the music industry, which ultimately led to a very competitive and hard to get job within the concerts industry and Live Nation. But part of what I was telling Hayden before we hit record here is that the music industry, entertainment in general, very competitive, very network driven industry. And there's... For better or for worse, there's a lot of favoritism and there's a lot of politics that you have to navigate. And ultimately, if the big players don't like you, probably not going to go too far within the industry. So I had to learn very early how to make sure I was 
providing value and understanding the needs of the people that I was trying to get in with. So for the concert venues, even just the example of booking my band, when you're trying to make a pitch to a venue that, hey, you should book my band, you got to lead with the type of stats that they're interested in. Like how many people can you draw? What kind of ticket price can you command? Does your crowd drink? Do you have anything to back that up? What kind of sales can we expect to make at the bar? So I think just learning what people were looking for and quickly adapting my behavior to speak to those needs allowed me to move pretty quick into that career path. And I worked for 10 years in the concerts industry. I worked there. I moved to Vegas in 2015. So I was 25 at the time. And I worked there for five years at Live Nation in the booking office. My job was to negotiate deals with the agents, set the price that they were going to get paid, set the ticket prices, manage the expenses, things like that. So again, very network-driven profession. And then COVID had different plans for me and had different plans for the entire concerts industry. But essentially, the whole industry shut down overnight. And it forced me to either sit around and wait for my job to come back in Las Vegas, which had a 26% unemployment during COVID, or find a new profession. And I chose the latter. So my wife and I picked up and moved back to Seattle, which is where most of my network was. And I got a job in the consulting industry. And I had to take a bit of a lateral move. So I I moved from a a booker position, which is mid-level position at Live Nation, back to a coordinator level um, within the consulting industry, where, by the way, I really knew nobody. So I had to restart, reboot my network within that company. But a lot of those dynamics I had learned about becoming your boss's painkiller and learning to speak their language and find the things that keep them up at night and solve them for them. All that kind of political intelligence uh, allowed me to move up pretty quickly within that company. Within the three years I've worked there, I've been promoted three times and now have a pretty comfortable role within the consulting industry. So anyway, that was a ton of backstory and context, but just some kind of free story of what networking has meant to me thus far. And I haven't even mentioned real estate yet, obviously, but I'll stop there for the moment. We'll get to real estate, I promise. What led you to decide to go for a business major when music was your passion? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to answer this a couple of different ways. So the passion for playing music has never gone away. I've always loved playing drums. I've always loved performing. But when you're 19 or 18 or whenever people are typically encouraged to pick a major, When I aligned that major with my passion, what I didn't realize is that by studying music and music education and performance in college, the types of jobs it was really setting me up for were things like being a high school music teacher or just jobs that aren't exactly the kind of like rock and roll performer, right? The actual prospects of professionally performing music as a career path, it's a different lifestyle. I did perform professionally for a while. I got paid but I always had other jobs. I always worked. I delivered pizza for a while. I worked at a drum store. I I sold drums and percussion. And so I found ways to fund my passion. But I think I quickly realized that the $80,000 I would pay for my degree in music education to produce a job that would pay $40,000, the math didn't quite add up. I also had a passion for business. And so I just... I connected the dots and realized I wasn't too late in my university experience to pivot. And so I just decided to make that switch while I still could and round it out with a business degree. I love it. I started with a business degree, but I like, I I wish I would have done entrepreneurship because that's what I do now is entrepreneurship. And there's a vast difference between being an entrepreneur and being a business person (laughs) because you can be a business person and work in a corporate job And the problems that come across your desk are much, much different than that of a new small business owner or the owner of several small businesses, as it is in my case. Okay, so I want to talk about your meeting with the president of your local Live Nation. Talk to me about that origin story. I want to go into how that happened and then what was running through your head as you were meeting this guy. Yeah, so... It's difficult to tell this story without it just sounding a little bit like nepotism. Let me say this. When you go to business school, the value usually is in the network 
just as much as it is the education, right? And so my classmate was the daughter of the president of Live Nation in Seattle. And so at that time, I had already been in bands and I had already strung together at least a few accomplishments and a bit of a network to demonstrate that this guy was motivated. He's an action taker. When I mentioned that, hey, I'm a musician, I love concerts and all that. Yeah, my dad's the president of Live Nation. Do you want me to introduce you guys? So I did have an extremely warm introduction from someone very close to him. But nonetheless, she actually invited me over to dinner at their house. So you've got hundreds of people that would love to just even get an email response from the guy, but there I am sitting at his dinner table. And so that was the first time I met him was at a family dinner with him and his wife, his daughter, which was a friend of mine through school and their other daughter. And we just had a nice, like very pleasant, casual person to person conversation. We didn't talk a whole lot of shop, but I think he was trying to get a sense for who I was and why his daughter invited me over to dinner. And from there, he invited me to come into the office two days later. I think the dinner was a Saturday night and he said, come in on Monday and let's chat and let's see how I can help you. And so I went into the office on Monday with a notebook and a shiny, I guess I was 21 at the time, 21 year old attitude. And I was ready to kick some ass. And we had a really nice conversation. He slid into that mentorship position very quickly and willingly. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to name him, but he's a really nice guy and, and very generous, but he is a bit hard to access. I take it, I don't take it lightly that he decided to do that and, and was generous with his time. And I even actually crafted it into a formal mentorship program that I got school credit for. I took that pitch to my professor and was able to spin it up into college credit. So I actually started getting to shadow him at his office and even go to some concerts for school credit. So yeah, th there's no other way to say it than that. That obviously completely transforms my entire career. What a perfect story. I feel like this is like the question I always ask at the end and we're already talking about it. This is <laughs> awesome. That right there is just such a perfect representation of why I started this podcast. Because a lot of people don't really think about what, who they're talking to and what the people do that they're talking to. Sometimes I meet people and they're like, oh, I just can't solve this problem. And I like to laugh in my head and I sit back and think about, you're literally like in this industry and you know five people you could call to fix the problem. But you just like, a lot of people try to figure it out themselves and go the hard route. And it's like, if your friend in class says that her dad runs the company that basically runs everything that you want to do, say yes, like I want to go meet that person. And I think you summed it up perfectly talking about how you went about going into that dinner. Y'all didn't talk much shop. You focused on making a connection with that guy and being present and just talking about whatever they wanted to talk about. And for me, that's been really successful in getting places that technically I, I should never be based off of who I, quote, I'm air quotes here, who I am. I love that story. That's so freaking cool. Thanks, man. Yeah, I think most mentors, more generous than people think, but they're always going to try and find ways to test you before they just start pouring into you. So in that case, I think he was trying to see, okay, is this guy, what's he all about? Is he a hard worker? Is he just looking for an easy win? Is he just looking to get it? Is he going to start dropping names and acting all cool? Or is he going to be a more fluid, natural person? So I definitely agree with you there that there's, you need to make those organic connections before you start thinking of all the different ways you're going to transact and cash in on whatever relationship you're trying to build people can see right through that right away focus on building the human value first there's nothing in my opinion more valuable than someone taking a genuine interest in you if he starts talking about how much he likes to fish then you're like tell me more about that <laughs> because even if you're not interested in fishing not that you're doing this to turn it into business, but maybe you can learn something about it, right? Maybe it could be a passion that you have. Ask the questions and see like, why do you like it so much? What do you enjoy about fishing? And that can lead you down another, down a path that can later lead to helping you get your vision and dreams fulfilled as well. Because all we really want in life is to see other people be successful, I feel. 100%, man. And that's one thing I noticed about you, right when we met, is you lead from an authentic place of genuinely wanting to provide value and, and learn, learn about other people and what makes them tick. 
And again, I don't think you can fake that. You could try, but I think eventually if you're, people can tell when you're asking questions just to try and like fabricate a connection, you have to really want that connection. And that's something I sense in you. And that's something I try to, I have always tried to include in my approach to meeting new people and networking. And I think the music industry was a good place for me to cut my teeth because I had no other choice. There's too much competition. There's too many people and there's so much ego. Good Lord, there's so much ego. I think you can't help it when you're surrounded by people who all think they're the coolest thing in the world. It does rub off on you a little bit. And frankly, I'm okay with having left that scene. I, I live a very different life now than I did when I was in my early 20s, which is, I'm 34 now. I have a two-year-old daughter. I've been married for five and a half years and we have twins that are coming in about a month. So it makes sense that my life is a little different than, I was, than when I was running and gunning at concerts four nights a week. But, but my approach to people has also changed too, right? Like I, I don't want to be surrounded by overinflated egos every which way I turn. And therefore the concerts industry, I think I had a nice run, 10 years. Saw some amazing things, saw some amazing shows, met some really cool people, learned a lot about connecting with people. And now I'm happy to be able to take that into the rest of my life, but with a completely different lifestyle. So for someone who works around an industry similar to yours, maybe in sales where there's a lot of ego or, or in an industry such as the performing arts, how do you navigate that? How do you be a person who's humble and kind and loving in an arena where a lot of the people around you are just trying to puff out their chest and show how big and how cool they are. How do you operate out of a place of being humble and still get to where you want to go in that industry? It's a really good question because in some ways I chose to depart that industry it was my way of, of achieving what I wanted to. I came to the conclusion that I was not cut out to move up much further than where I already was by the time I left. It was something I wanted going into it. Like I, I was very intentional and very passionate about the career track I was on, but there was a turning point where the ego and the just general, the way that most people carry themselves, especially like I was in the arenas and the stadiums and where the biggest stars were. And it wasn't the stars that were assholes. It was their crew. It was their managers. It was the people that just, they walk in like they own the place. And I am all for curating great experiences. And we were the promoter. So our job was to pay the artists fairly, negotiate and put on the production, budget the expenses correctly, be the liaisons with the venue to make between the venue and the artist, and also provide a great day of show experience. And so I was the money guy. So my job was to show up and settle the show. Settling the show means we take all the ticket audits. We take all the bills. I go in a room with the accountant for the artist and we sit down and we reconcile all those bills and any receipts that need to be settled or squared up, I write them a check for. And then at the end of the night, I have to write this big check. We say, hey, we sold $2 million in tickets. It costs us a million dollars to put on the show. You guys get this percentage. Here's a check for... $800,000. And there's some argument sometimes this should be an expense. This should not be, you guys should pay for this. You're Live Nation, you got the pockets. It's like there is a contract. There's a signed contract between the promoter and the agent and the artist. Yet people would always try and tiptoe around it, you know, push me over. Right? You're just some 25 year old kid that works for Live Nation. You're not actually Live Nation. Get me your boss. And so I'm just, I'm painting this picture because. Like in what world other than entertainment, is it okay to just disregard a contract and try and push somebody over for a few extra bucks? So that's, real the type of shit. <laughs> that's the type of shit. Yeah. I guess real estate, sometimes that happens. The industry that happens when I was in car sales, you always had somebody trying to push something like my boss was trying to push stuff onto the customer and the customer would try to push stuff onto us. And I feel like that's just something you have to navigate no matter what industry you're in. Yeah. So maybe that's my ego, right? Saying that, oh, this problem is unique to my industry. But uh, your question though, is how do you navigate it? And for me, I think at first I tried to figure out, okay, how can I project confidence without my ego taking over? And that was a really difficult thing for me in that setting. 
because that was a very schmoozing, boozing, flashy, especially in Vegas, ridiculous setting where it was a competition for who can be the best entertainer. I'm not talking about performer. I'm talking about who can take the agent to the nicest club, who can spend the most money or get the most comp, fancy comp dinner. And like, that just wasn't my scene, especially as a support player. So what I ended up doing is I fall back to that, figure out the pain points. Uh, I realized that my role was more of an operator. I was not meant to be out on the front line as a schmoozer, boozer. And so I found out what are the things that my boss cares the most about? What are the things he wants to do the least? How can I really be his painkiller? And so playing that role put me in favor with my bosses, right? They knew I could get shit done. They knew I could keep their lives as easy as possible so that they could go do the schmoozing and boozing. And so I think that was my approach to it. And that's why I made the determination. I don't think I'm going to be able to go much further down this career path unless I change who I am in a way that I don't want to. And so... When COVID hit, it was a blessing in disguise. I could have stuck with concerts. I could have waited. My job would have come back eventually. But I don't think I would be sitting here. Like I said, it worked out well. I I, I moved into the consulting industry. I was able to move up a couple of ranks. I make a lot more money than I did. I work from home. I've got my young daughter and twins on the way. And I'm going to be able to be a present father and not be out at shows three or four nights a week. So it all worked out. Those are some of the lessons I learned. And to top, to top that, you still have all of your connections in that industry. So I would probably be willing to bet if you ever wanted to go to some kind of concert, you could probably pull some strings and uh, shoot out some text messages and, and possibly get some tickets. I may or may not have done that a few times since I left the, the industry. But yeah, I have a lot of really good friends I've met along the way, including some close friends that I've helped open some doors for and get jobs and they're doing really well or that just because I left the industry doesn't mean I, I don't have good solid connections that I've spent a lot of time building relationships with. And you never know when that stuff comes around. Like when I, we still have barely talked about real estate yet, but like when I started posting openly that, Hey, I'm a real estate investor. I do own eight single family homes across three states. And I started sharing that more openly on places like LinkedIn. And I've been surprised some of the people that have come back around and I hadn't heard from in a few years and they're interested because they want to invest in real estate. And that's actually part of why I started offering coaching this summer was like I had, by starting to share openly that I was investing in real estate, I was hearing from all sorts of people and I was getting these signals of interest that people are interested in it, but they don't know how. And uh, I'm not trying to make this big sales pitch for my coaching, but it's just an example of how my previous network has remained in my orbit and I've remained in there. Orbits. Yeah, it's you never know what's going to come out of the woodwork from 15 years ago. 15 years ago, I was probably in middle school, but <laughs> in, in 15 years, who knows what's going to come out of what I'm doing right now, you know? Um, so I want to kind of transition and talk about your entrance into this new, new industry, new company. You know almost nobody. What were some of the first steps you took to start building your network and start building rapport with your coworkers and bosses? I know I've already said this three or four times, right? But I, I really believe one of the best attitudes and approaches, especially in a new organization where you don't know your way around yet, and you can't lean on relationships, is to figure out what the person you report to does not like to do, figure out what they care about the most. Those aren't always the same thing, right? And focus on learning those skills as quickly as possible. Now, obviously, if they're completely outside of your job scope, you got to tread carefully there. Like you got to tackle your core job and the core competencies that you're hired for. But I think learning those dynamics and demonstrating that you understand them to the person you report to is a very quick way to build good social capital And I say that not to sound transactional, but it's genuinely, it just shows aptitude that you get it. You understand the business, you understand what they care about and why they care about it. So I think that's the first like quick win that I looked for. And I also like had the music industry and entertainment industry move so fast. It never sleeps. It's very common to get emails at 10 a.m. or 3 a.m. And so I learned to work at a very quick pace. I learned to respond quickly and 
speak with a sense of urgency, but also a, a sense of calm, right? I was the back end support guy. And so I think not every industry has that level of attention. And so when I showed up and I was timely, attentive, responsive, even just think simple things like responding quickly to an email when somebody asks you a question, whether or not you had the answer right then, just like being dependable. I really leaned into like, how can I just show that I am put together and, and can learn quickly the dynamics of this business, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I found that working in the restaurant industry gave me some of the same qualities when I worked at the Fortune 150 company that I worked at. When you simply do one more thing than what everyone else is willing to do, the bosses will love you. Like the, when I was in the corporate world, I would just like always be asking like, hey, what can I do? How can I help make your life easier? And the managers will look at me like, who are you? Like you're a godsend. And no one ever asked me that. One of my, one of my really, I, I need to go get dinner with her sometime soon, but one of my good friends, Lorna, that I worked with, she was like, she always spoke so highly of me when I wasn't around and my manager would always come back and say, Lorna just adores you. And I was like, that, it means so much to hear that when you know that you, it just feels for me like I'm just doing my job. But I, I think a lot of times we forget that most people are just doing the absolute bare minimum that they can to get by and get their check. And if you just do a little bit more, if you just ask one more question, make one more connection, it can really make a big difference to the people around you. A couple of things come to mind there. You mentioned restaurant, right? So I used to deliver pizza. I did that on the side for three or four years when I was in my late teens, early 20s. It was when the, in the drumming days, so I needed something to supplement the minimal income I was making from that. And I was still in school at the time too, but work delivering pizza, it's super easy to just pull your car up and go grab the pizza boxes and then go deliver the pizza and do nothing else. But I enjoyed meeting all the different people in the different lines, right? There's the cashier, there are the pizza cooks, there's the salad person, there are the people in the back cleaning. And I would try and not only, it's like little things, like smiling and acknowledging someone who's cleaning the back room. Like those people don't often get a lot of love, which is sad because they're doing something that's very important for the business. So little things like smiling and saying hi. And then also I would, if I walked past the table that needed to be bus, I would grab the plates. And it wasn't even, it didn't even occur to me that not everyone does that, right? Because it just, it felt like something that if you work at this place and there's an easy low hanging fruit activity like that to do, why wouldn't you do it? But it, it didn't occur to me that was a differentiator until I learned that not everyone does it. So take that example and apply it to any industry, any job. And if you can operate that way, it's definitely a competitive advantage. Since we're talking about competitive advantages, this isn't what I often get into in my podcast because most of the time I'm interviewing like business owners, entrepreneurs. So they've been removed from this world for a long time. But when you, a lot of times you can know, like you, you notice around you what people are doing and what they're not. But I always found that even when I'd go above and beyond in the service industry, a lot of times it's not rewarded because they want to keep your pay rate as low as possible. So if you're going above and beyond in the service industry, every once in a while, you should really go and talk to your boss and say, hey, do you feel like I deserve a raise? Just ask that question. And watch them get a little squirmy in their chair. And sometimes it could also be like, hey, I deserve a raise. I'm getting a raise or I'm leaving because I know I'm valuable. But make sure that you are having that conversation because I've found often that the service industry is slow to reward, at least in my experience in the five restaurants that I worked in. If they can keep you at the same pay rate, and if you do more than anyone else, it's like, all right, score. We got a great worker here. Like, we'll give them extra hours, but make sure you know your worth and ask those questions. Or with what you've learned from being in that industry, like Aaron did in the music industry, maybe if you feel like you've hit a plateau, start looking at other opportunities as well, because those skills are so valuable in a multitude of industries. Absolutely. And I think too, that not every industry. So when I worked in the music industry, even as a booker, my level of job didn't have a direct incentive tied to my performance. So even if I booked a bunch of profitable shows and made a ton of money for the company, 
more than was expected, like I got no additional compensation as a result. And so I've always, and one of the reasons I'm in real estate, I've always tried to find jobs where I can actually tie in a financial incentive to my performance because it doesn't feel right to put a ton of additional marginal effort into something if there's not a way to be rewarded. It doesn't have to be financial, but something, right? That's a part of my frustration with the music industry was that I was pouring so much of my energy and my time. I was driving myself nuts, which is another story, but it turned into a thing where I was, I became resentful of the industry. And I started, I had my coping with that was to lean on my vices. And I was drinking way too much. And I was just, it, it turned into a spiral of resentment. Mm. I landed myself essentially in a short stint in inpatient rehab to try and get myself out of that cycle. And that's straying from the point of networking. But basically, I think it was because I just, I couldn't square all that ego and all that behavior that I didn't, it wasn't in line with my values. I wasn't being compensated in a way that felt commensurate with the input I was giving. And all the while it was affecting my mental and physical health. And so I had to make this abrupt change. Very glad I did. I'm four and a half years sober now. That was one of the best one of the best changes, if not the best change I've ever made in my life. And I would say the only only secondary to obviously getting married and, and building a family is the best thing I've ever done. But that was a turning point. And I don't think it's a coincidence that three months after I got sober, we bought our first rental property. There's no way that's a coincidence because I think what happened is I, I discovered that if I put all that type of energy and time and effort into that, which is something that actually benefits directly my myself and my family, that's going to pay off in the long run. And I feel better about putting that energy into that. So that's like just a little bit of context on how I got into real estate. And from there, we fell in love with the process of, okay, that's that entrepreneurial itch that we're scratching now. We're building something for ourselves. We're building something for our family that's going to serve us long into the future, potentially future generations. Uh, and then the rest... It's history. And then I met Hayden. <laughs> so I want to hit on sobriety. I think that being willing to say, hey, this is not okay. I need help. That is definitely you're seeking a connection. I think that possibly that's one of the best ways to connect is to find an accountability partner, to find somebody who may be struggling with the same thing and wants to no longer struggle with that anymore. Um, I think so. I am, I wouldn't say that I'm like, sober like in the sense of I was an alcoholic and now I'm not I drink way less than I used to like I used to drink it wasn't like every night but it was every weekend I'd go and party and live it up which I don't necessarily think is the worst thing because we have seasons but when I started getting into business and realizing I started looking around at the real estate investors realtors and real estate professionals that were around me and I noticed that there's basically two sides. There's either someone who's sober and has gone down that path and is that's not the path that I want to go down, or they're usually alcoholics. Like they're real estate professionals and this industry, this world is so up and down and so uncertain. And one day it's great and you're celebrating till you drink. And the next day it's horrible. You just lost a hundred grand. So you drink to not think about the fact that you just lost a bunch of money. And it's so easy to land and, and to lean on those vices. And I, I think it really applies to any industry, any work. Like life is stressful. Work is stressful. Being an entrepreneur is stressful. But I feel like you, re you realize like I need to reach out to someone and I need to fix this. I think you nailed it. It's you are looking for a connection and not to get too ethereal, but I think in recovery, that connection, that first connection that you're encouraged to make is with a power greater than yourself, whether you call that God or uh, there's a joke in uh, AA that you can make the doorknob your higher power as long as it's not you. Because the line of thinking goes that if you are your own higher power, that means you are a slave to your ego. And that is not where you want to be because typically the decisions that you made when you're in your addictive cycle are what got you in trouble. So if you want to change the outcomes and the the patterns that are occurring around you, you have to change your behavior, which starts with getting outside of yourself. 
So I will get off my recovery soapbox there, but that's the line of thinking that comes with it, right? So I think there's, I like the way you said that it's, you're seeking a connection. And then of course, when you, in doing so, you connect with other people who have similar struggles and accountability is a big thing and accountability to yourself and accountability to others. And I would say the other really cool thing about going through that experience was you, if you have 10 days of sobriety and somebody walks in with no sobriety, to them, you are an example of what could be if they can string the other 10 days. And so this idea of just, you don't need a lot to be able to help others. That is something I would, I knew, and it's, I always try to be generous and pay it forward. I love the concept of paying it forward, but the altruism that comes in recovery is like, to me, that was the most beautiful part of it was at some point, you obviously do it for yourself. You need to get yourself right in order to fix whatever was going wrong. But you also start to feel a true sense of pride in being able to give that energy and inspiration forward to other people who are going through similar struggles, whether it's helping someone through a struggle or helping somebody who's new in a career path, or the first time you and I ever talked, Aiden, you, you, I could see the wheel spinning in your head. What can I do that would help this person accomplish the things that they told me are important to them? And like that kind of service first mentality, to me, that's the way, that's the way to be. I'm so glad that you saw that. We can talk about this when you interview me. So some people see that different ways. Some people see when I'm asking these questions about, hey, what do you do? Like, how can I help? Sometimes it seems like I'm just like prying into somebody's life to try and see what I can extract out of them. And I had a conversation with one of my friends while I was in Miami and I was like, that's not, that's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to see how I can connect that person to someone that I know that might be able to help them. And so that kind of like, it dawned on her and she's like, oh, wait, like that makes sense. Like you aren't trying to figure out how it can benefit you. You're trying to figure out how you can benefit them. And so I feel like you have to walk a fine line with that because sometimes it can just seem like you're asking these questions. You have to be careful when you're asking people questions and really feel out, do these people really want to talk to me about this or not? And do I feel like I'm coming across this? I just want to see what I can get out of that person. And I really appreciate that compliment. It means a lot to me. That's So what I try to do is I'm always, you're right, my wheels are always turning. <laughs> when someone tells me what they do, I'm like, wait, who do I know where you are? Like, how can I help get you to be in a better position? People are rightfully skeptical because I think inherently there are a lot of people out there that are only looking out for themselves. Uh, I don't think that is an overly exaggerated thing to say. Like a lot of people really do just look out for themselves, number one. And then when they talk to someone, they're just looking for what they can get out of them. And so it is hard when you're someone like yourself, or I would like to think someone like me, and you're asking these questions because you want to know you're genuinely interested, not only in learning about the person, but also seeing if there's a way you can potentially help them. That is not the norm, unfortunately. And so some people perceive it the wrong way, but I think it's better to take those risks and ask those questions and let them be the judge, right? If they want to be skeptical and think you're a you know, nosy prick, then then so, so be Probably it. Probably right? not that's... the person to be connected with me anyways, if, if that's the vibe they get. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, we've time has really flown. It's already... Where are you? 50 minutes in, which is unbelievable. Let's talk about real estate, man. Let's dive into it because I want to talk about how important connections have been in your real estate. Really want to hammer on that because I talk about real estate a lot because everyone knows that's what I do. But tell, talk to me about your first rental property. What connection led to that? Really interesting, man, because at the very beginning of our real estate journey, we were pretty insulated. I wasn't one of those guys that read rich dad, poor dad, and peruse the bigger pockets forums for 12 months before we bought our first rental. We lived in downtown Las Vegas. We bought a primary property in 2017 that was exclusively, the purpose was to live in it. My wife and I got married in the backyard there and we were building a life. We, this was right around before I went to rehab and did the whole sobriety U-turn. And so when that happened, that was 2019. I got this, had all this new energy because I wasn't 
misdirecting it into my vices anymore. And I decided that, hey, we want to do something for ourselves. I want to remove my dependency on having this seemingly dead end entertainment job suck all the energy out of me. We want to build something for ourselves. My parents, my mom and my stepdad, have been real estate investors since the early 2000s. And so they had encouraged, encouraged us to consider investing in real estate. I wouldn't say they were like, you should do this, but they said, hey, this is an option. This is something you can do. They knew how to do it. We skipped the expensive wedding. So we got married in our backyard. It was $150 for the court fees. And we paid a, a minister from downtown Las Vegas, uh, $75. He offered us the, the Elvis upsell. He would dress as Elvis for an extra 50 bucks if we wanted. We turned that down. You turned Sorry. down the Elvis offer? I know, unthinkable. Dang. But our whole wedding cost $225 instead of 50000 So we were able to take that money and apply it to a rental property. We bought it right down the street from us. We found an agent off Zillow. We've really lucked out because he ended up being a great agent. But I say all this because I would say networking and connections did not really influence that first rental. But what it did do, that agent, we really invested in the relationship with him. He turned, he was very generous with his willingness to educate us. We didn't know a lot about it. Like I said, I hadn't read a bunch of Bigger Pockets books first. So I was learning everything on the fly through my parents and then through this agent. With my entrepreneurial mind, I we formed the LLC and started looking into the tax implications and all that. But where the networking comes in is that agent called us four months later after we had closed on that first rental. And he said, hey, I, I heard about these two houses that are being sold as a package. It's off market. It's a bunch of partners that want to cash out. They're on five-year leases with paying 30% above market rent with built-in rent escalators. We're like, holy shit, like two, two houses on basically commercial leases with crazy cash flow. And we didn't have, we had spent most of our money on the first rental. So we didn't have a ton left but we had to get creative. So we found a lender that helped us you know, figure out how to get in at a low down payment. We sold a bunch of stocks. Then that same lender helped us refi out of uh, and cash out of our primary. So we were having to like forge, in order to get that deal, we were having to quickly forge relationships with uh, lawyers and lenders and, and then really that relationship we had built with our agent. And so I think that's when I started to realize it's not as simple as just like going on the MLS and clicking buy now, put it in your shopping cart. There are relationships that you have to build with people like lenders and to, especially the more mortgages you take on, the harder it is to get a loan, the more you have to uh, prove that you're lendable and reliable. So I, I did start to learn that stuff along the fly. I'll fast forward a bit because I know we're running out of time, but we, we own eight properties now across three states. But it started with like buying in our backyard with an agent we met off Zillow to us really understanding, okay, no, we need to be more methodical. We need to find investor-friendly agents, investor-friendly lenders. We need to learn the areas, walk into the banks, shake the people's hands, try and be more than just like a faceless person behind a computer screen, but actually build relationships and we're six years into our investing journey. We have good teams on the ground in the markets that we're in. We live in Houston, Texas now. The closest rental we have is 1,000 miles away. The furthest one is 3,000 miles. Without those relationships and teams on the ground, we'd be in trouble. How did you build your teams on the ground in all these different markets? I know it's a hot button question for people who are looking to invest out of state. What methods did you use to vet your contractors and, and make sure that you were dealing with good people? Yeah, so in two of the three markets, we so in Vegas, we lived there as we were buying our rentals. So we bought those three that I mentioned earlier, and then we kept our primary when we moved up to Washington, and we turned that into a rental. So we had four rentals there. Uh, we've self-managed those the whole time. But while we lived there, we you know had electricians that we used, plumbers that we used, handymen. So we actually had a close friend that, was our kind of like boots on the ground. He was our first call. We paid him a small retainer to basically be available if we needed, if something went wrong at the house, we would call him and say, hey, can you go lay eyes on it? That way we didn't have to pay a $125 trip fee to an electrician just to go reset a breaker box. So 
that was the kind of model we used for Vegas. And in Washington, we also self-managed the properties while we lived there because we were in the area. And I'm not a handy person by any means. Like I'm afraid to hang a picture on my wall almost. Me that's too. like the that's like the level I'm at. So Can when I, I say that drywall self- hanger incorrect, that's like my <laughs> exactly I'm, myself. I'm afraid to mess stuff up. But that's the level I'm at. So when I say self-managed stuff like leasing and marketing and the uh, I'm like a back end operations type guy. But then when we moved, we hired a, a manager that we met through an investor group and we had a couple of meetings with her in person. And we really tried to feel out like, okay, we were considering, do we self-manage from afar or do we hire someone? And we spoke to several investors that worked with her and I got a great read off her. I asked, I have a whole list of questions that I asked different team members. And so I ran her through all that and she, she answered to my satisfaction and she was able to find a really high rent for the property that we moved out of there. So we decided to work with her. Iowa is a story that I don't even know if we have time for because we're actually, we went through our third property manager. We had a horrible experience with our first one. We did thorough interviewing. I asked all the same questions that I just mentioned. And we bought that, the, our first house there, sight unseen. And we thought we had the perfect team on the ground because the property manager that we interviewed, he answered all our questions the way I wanted him to. But it was all a lie. And, and their company turned out to be pretty much a, a scam, even though they had reviews and they had investor testimonials and stuff like that. But they basically, they neglected our property. We bought it in the middle of, we closed on the first week of January. They listed it way too high. Uh, and they weren't even monitoring the property. The gas had been shut off. There was no heat in the winter in the middle of Iowa. There were pipes freezing and it was a disaster. So that experience almost scared us away. But then we found an amazing property manager through our agent. And to fit the theme of your show, it was our agent, our relationship with our agent there that rescued us because she was able to quickly introduce us to a different PM who, who came in and saved the day quickly. When I say we're on our third, that property manager that saved the day, she was also an agent. So she had to make a choice at one point of, do I be a PM or an agent? So she went back to being an agent. Then I had to hire another PM. Turns out we hired another complete shithead. And, and so we so employed him. the fourth. Yeah, no, we're the fourth. Oh, um, you're the fourth. So that's what we decided. So we had enough people in our Rolodex, enough vendors that PM who went back to be an agent, she was she's still very close with us and she's willing to help provide those judgment calls on the ground. And we said, why the hell are we going to pay somebody to do a shitty job? We can handle all the back end ourselves. We know how to do that. So all we really need is a reliable list of people that we can call on the ground when stuff comes up. And we have that. So I don't know if I answered your question. That's no, our that's experience. That's exactly it. The end of it right there. That's perfect. Even if you can't get the person that you need, if you just reach out to someone that knows who you need, it, your problem is solved. I don't know if that said that in a really not sexy way. But yeah, basically. You, you can invest. How, how many miles away is Iowa from you? Is that the 2,000 mile? So Washington's 2,700 miles away. Iowa's, yeah, about 1,000. Yeah, so that's how you invest 1,000 miles away is it first starts with an agent and then it starts with a property manager and then even if the property manager goes away, you can still leverage those connections that they have with their subcontractors. And it's really just this big web. And it seems so daunting and scary. But now that you're doing it, does it seem very scary? If there's a problem in, in Iowa, is, is that a huge deal to you? Or are you just like, okay, let's figure this out? Yeah, I do not lose sleep at night when problems happen because we've been through many problems and we've been able to solve them. If that frozen pipe neglected house situation didn't scare us away, then we feel equipped to solve uh, problems as they come up. And I will say it's, you know, real estate comes with risks. It's not the same as buying Apple stock and just sitting on it for 30 years. It comes with some work and there are things that'll go wrong. But if you have a problem solvers mentality, if you're good at making connections, there, there are ways to solve just about any problem you'll come across. I love it. Okay, we've come up on our time. I wanna honor your time. Why don't you go and tell the listeners about uh, where they can find you? Sure, man. This has been a blast. I really appreciate it. We went a full hour and probably could go another one if, if I had to guess, but um, I appreciate you having me on. So my name's Aaron Amin. 
I write a newsletter and I run a podcast, both of which are called The Hybrid Real Estate Professional. My newsletter is free. It goes out three times a week. It's a lot of information, all free about my journey building this portfolio of eight rental properties across three states. There's a lot of tactical information and how-tos, the software we use to manage our portfolio, the bookkeeping stuff, the automations, how we use virtual assistants, all that stuff's there for free. So if anybody is you know, following a similar path, I encourage you to click through. You don't even have to subscribe. You can just go to the hybrid real estate professional.com and view the whole archives. And I also post on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Just look me up under my name, Aaron Amin, and you will find me. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, Aaron. If you guys do me a favor, this show is completely free. I do all this work just for you because I love you. One thing I do ask is if you go and leave a five-star review on the podcast, whether you're listening to on Apple, scroll down to the bottom and click on the five stars, or if you're on Spotify, click up there and click on five stars for me. That is the only thing that I ask. And then if you got value out of this, throw it on your Instagram, throw it on your Twitter, wherever you share, just share a little screenshot of it and share it with your friends so they can hear this awesome episode as well. If you're in the Chattanooga area, I have started up Chattanooga's best real estate meetup. It's called Southeast Best Real Estate Meetup. We meet at North Shore Auto Gallery the first Thursday of every month at 530. So if you're anywhere in the region, my goal is to bring investors from Atlanta, Nashville, Huntsville, and Knoxville all together and for us to talk about the Southeast region and what's going on in real estate. So hope you guys got a lot of value out of this episode and we'll see you on the next one.